Good afternoon. I'm Rob Greenwood, director of the Harris Center at Memorial University. And thank you for joining us for the fifth edition of the Harris Center special series, Scenario Sessions, Conversations Exploring the Impacts of COVID-19 on the Economy of Newfoundland and Labrador. We are happy to be able to present these sessions in partnership with conference and event services here at the Amira Innovation Exchange on Memorial Signal Hill campus. I'm here in the EIX with John Duff, who's on the other side of the room from me, and uh, delighted to have people uh, join us virtually. EIX has amazing technology capability as well. Uh, so far in these sessions, we have spoken with experts in business, tourism, mining, clean tech, and today we're talking about fishery and aquaculture. A key driver of the rural economy in Newfoundland and Labrador, and indeed for the whole province, the fishing and aquaculture industry was hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. From the impacts and instability in the global markets, to the health and safety measures for workers. Today, we're talking to two leaders in the sector to get a better understanding of how the industry is adjusting and what role fishing and aquaculture could play in the economic recovery of our province and what we need to be doing now to ensure we capitalize on the opportunities for growth. It's my pleasure to introduce our two panelists. Dr. Laura Halfyard is the general manager for Conagra Fish Farms, Inc. Conagra is her family's Newfoundland organic mussel farming operation that continues to develop shellfish technology for the South Coast Newfoundland Labrador environment. Dr. Halfyard is currently a mussel representative for the Newfoundland Aquaculture Industry Association and a past president. She has over 30 years of experience with the Fisheries and Marine Institute of Memorial University. As an aquaculture fishery specialist, including education and gender resources, working in Canada, as well as Asian and African developing countries. She is also a member of the Halapu Mi'kmaq First Nation Band. Our second guest, Kevin Anderson, is the head school of fisheries at the Fisheries and Marine Institute of Memorial. Prior to joining the Marine Institute, Kevin held a variety of positions in Fisheries and Oceans Canada, including Regional Director General, Regional Director of Fisheries and Aquaculture Management, and Director of Conservation and Protection. More recently, he served as Senior Advisor on Indigenous Relations at DFO's National Headquarters in Ottawa. Kevin taught graduate level courses in Fisheries Resource Management as a permanent instructor at the Marine Institute since 1999. He also served as a member of the Institute Industry Advisory Committee he holds a BA Poli Sci and B. Ed from Memorial, along with an MSc in Marine Policy from the London School of Economics. Welcome, Laura and Kevin. Thank you. Good afternoon. We have two more qualified people to be uh, giving us an overview of this critical industry in the province. And in our scenario sessions, we're really looking at the short, medium, and long term scenarios. Obviously, lots of uh, ponderables and uh, issues that will develop over time. But to start us off, really, Kevin and Laura, could you give us a, a high level picture on how fishery aquaculture sectors look like now? Uh, how is it adjusted to the COVID-19 pandemic? And just kind of the scope and importance of the sector for the province. Uh, Kevin, want to lead off? Sure. Well, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think whenever we talk about the fishery uh, in this year, what's it look like now? We need to think about it pre-COVID and post-COVID. I think there's a different description there. So looking at the pre-COVID fishery, of course, the status quo, I'd like to look at it in the last 10 years. And what we've seen generally is a, a steady decline in the overall landings. I think in 2010, we we're at 325,000 tons in Newfoundland and Labrador, and that dropped to about 250,000 tons in 2019. However, the value of the fishery have increased over that time period. For example, in 2010, the value of the Newfoundland Labrador fishery, the landed value that is, around 510 million. In 2019, that had grown to 812 million. Some trend lines, we see a general decline in the number of fishing enterprises in Newfoundland and Labrador, that is the vessels, the owner operators and the large companies and so on. I think that decline is greater than 50% since the moratorium 
But in that time period between 2010 and 2019, it, it dropped from 4,200 to 3,360. So the value per enterprise has actually increased. I'm not speaking necessarily for adjustments for inflation, but overall the value per enterprise has increased in that timeline. Uh, what we do, while well, we can describe the fishery and in a general terms, its total number of participants, its value, its landings on the Newfoundland and Labrador scale, I think it's very important when you're describing the status of the fishery, and I think this will register well with individuals across the province, is that there's quite a variation between areas. There's a very much a temporal spatial dynamic to the fishery that's been ongoing forever since fisheries began here. And uh, so sometimes fisheries are, are up in a specific area, depending on the species, depending on market conditions, and, and other times it's down. Examples, of course, is that we're seeing generally increased landings in lobster in recent years. We're seeing significant declines in the total available land uh, resource for shrimp, and uh, cod continues to be relatively low. What we also have as a description of the fishery over that time period is a is a demographic reality of an aging workforce, both in the harvesting and in processing sectors. And then in the COVID context this year, we see a we saw a delay in the fishery. I would caution you, we see many delays at start of fisheries, ice, weather, labor disruptions. There are many delays, but this particular year it was COVID specific. And of course that's somewhat associated to market conditions. We saw prices decline significantly for things like Atlantic halibut and shrimp. Both of these species very much connected to the institutional markets, cruise ships, large buffets, restaurants in general. Whereas for crab, while we did see a significant decline, some of which is associated with the fact that prices were very high in recent years, prices this year is a little more normal, but 50% of the Newfoundland Labrador crab actually enters the uh, retail sector, which is not as, been in, as impacted uh, by COVID-19 as, uh, as uh, the institutional markets. Overall, I would say that both the harvesting and the processing sector have done very well in adjusting, preparing. I, I think the crab fishery is largely over, other fisheries are, are starting up, but generally speaking, both, sec both the harvesting and processing sectors, I think, have done a very good job of responding to COVID and continuing operations in 2020. I'll leave it there, Rob. That's great, Kevin, thank you. And Laura, I know you're capable of speaking on the fishery as well as aquaculture, but uh, what would you want to add to what Kevin has said there? Well, I guess uh, looking at for us, if, uh, for Newfoundland, for the aquaculture industry, we're looking at the salmon and the mussel species. Uh, if you look at the figures, you know, for 2018, uh, you know, it was worth uh, almost 961 million to our economy, uh, over two. Uh, 2 million in wages directly. Um, 2019 data is not fully out yet, but 2020 with this COVID, it's been a major hit. Uh, it's been felt a little less with the salmon industry because the salmon industry feeds into both the retail stores and also into the restaurants. The restaurant sector has been the big hit in particular in relation to the muscle sector of our economy for uh, that. So when you look at it, um, I mean, aquaculture right now accounts for over uh, uh, 3,500 person years to the economy. So it's very important uh, to what's going on. Um, when COVID hit, there was an immediate response because the first thing we had to do was address that uh, the farmed aquaculture products weren't on the essential list of foods. So uh, right to getting it across the border into different countries, both federal and provincial had to address changing uh, of the Agri-Foods Act and getting it into that uh, documents so you could get uh, still continue the flow and movement. Um, when you went to a store, you'd see it in Newfoundland, you saw the first thing I noticed was the aquaculture or the fresh seafood counter almost disappeared. So therefore, you now didn't have fresh salmon, you didn't have fresh mussels and other things that were uh, in the from the wild sector. That was a major hit to us all across Canada and into the US and elsewhere. Um, when you look at it, getting it across the ferry, 
we had to look at, you went from a thousand people and including trucks coming to the island. Now you are down to one tenth, 100 who had priority of movement of items. So the provincial government had to work with, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Marine services to make sure that fresh product did have a priority to keep that flow of what was going to different sectors. You had changes within the processing of distancing um, of workers. So, you know, a lot of the processing plants had to retool for distancing of the workers during this COVID stage. It was a little less felt directly on the farm sites because I guess you're all in rubber gear and clothes and things like that. And if you're doing something that requires uh, mechanical lifting, so it was less impacts there. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think the industry worked around these things, tried to, but the, the big hit then was that really you were maintaining inventory in the water. It's unlike the wild fishery, which is capture at a peak time from the wild and then usually freeze or process it. In aquaculture, you're dealing a lot with fresh product. So now you have, it's just the same as your beef or your chicken. You've got to maintain that livestock. So therefore programs like the wage subsidy programs and all those things were a huge uh, help to the industry to get through this critical time because you still got to maintain the husbandry of the animals. Uh, we in the mussel industry were also helped through programs like the Atlantic Fisheries Fund because as the animal keeps growing, it gets heavier so that, you know, there was assistance with uh, uh, infrastructure of flotation and things like that. So programs like that, while we're right in the heat of the moment with uh, with uh, COVID, has been a big um, impact on the aquaculture industry, but we're working our way through each issue as each day occurs. Well, maybe Laura will stick with you and then look forward now, short term, over the next year or two, what do you see as the key opportunities and what do you see as the challenges for aquaculture in, in the immediate term? Well, I think uh, going forward, we're going to have a huge backlog of inventory that's in the water. Uh, you hear this on TV when you listen to the, the, uh, the, the cattle farmers, right? We have the same thing here, uh, whether it's uh, salmon or mussels, you have to move that inventory because they're on a three year cycle. So now mm -hmm. all of a sudden you've got all that inventory that you have to maintain while you also have to move in the new crop of product for the next year cycle. Um, and we don't know when we're coming out of COVID. Uh, so therefore you got to look at where are your markets? We know the US is still a hot spot. We know there have been issues when we hear of the China market in relation to uh, certain seafoods like salmon, which uh, is another issue, but we've got to move that out. The processors are starting to look at also more value added products. So therefore like the wild sector where you can have a longer shelf life, I think that's going to be a big push in the aquaculture industry to move that forward. Um, within regulation, we still have in the next few years to address some things between federal and provincial regulatory issues. Right now, we're still stuck in a bottleneck in Newfoundland where uh, a salmon hatchery is tied to a salmon marine site, and that doesn't exist anywhere else. It's like saying if I have a house and I want to pave my driveway, if I do anything to the house, it affects what I do on my driveway. The two don't necessarily connect. Um, we're also still in the next few years looking at major upgrades to telecommunications. My workers are out on the water and they got to get out in a place out on the edge of the site to get a cell phone. If there's an accident happens, cell reception. A lot of our salmon farming is what we base on real time telecommunications where you can tell the temperature of the water, what inventory is there, how much salmon is moving right to the marketplace. And that's all real time data. So you got to upgrade, upgrade the infrastructure that feeds that um, technology. And infrastructure itself is 
still a huge issue with our industry at wharves. We're getting to bigger vessels. Um, the infrastructures that are there are for smaller operations. So those things have to change. Clean wharves for organic and for uh, uh, BAP certifications and all these are critical to a good quality product. Thanks, Laura. Well, Kevin, fishery, of course, covers a whole lot of territory and a whole lot of species and markets. Uh, but high level, looking out uh, in the immediate term, what are your thoughts? Or is it a good story? Is it challenging? What are some of the things we need to do to address the opportunities and the constraints? I, I think the fishery comes with many challenges and is not difficult to generate a significant list of challenges. But yet the fishery consistently demonstrates it's very difficult to know next year or the year after for a variety of different reasons. Who could have anticipated uh, COVID and, and can you we know if it's a bad ice year or a good ice year in 2021? Uh, I think the short term, we will continue to have fluctuation in the resource uh, availability. Uh, I think we see good examples of that as what we've observed in the last year or two with cod along the south coast, what we continue to see with shrimp. And at the same time, we see some in, some, in most areas, I guess, stabilization in crab. So the short term will very much still be about a shellfish story in Newfoundland and Labrador in terms of the economic value of the fishery. Uh, nothing substantially, I don't think, will change in that respect over the next two years. Uh, there will be localized and, and, fluctu and fluctuations and even on large scales with some species over that time period. But the big story, of course, is COVID and, and the impacts on markets, as Laura just articulated, for the aquaculture industry is very similar. Uh, the the short-term impacts are not the same, as Laura described, the, the, the seafood industry, the wild seafood industry of Newfoundland and Labrador is largely uh, a frozen product exported. So you don't, you're not dealing with the short-term shelf uh, life issues that you're dealing with agriculture, but nevertheless, there's significant uncertainty in the marketplace. We still do not know where, where the story ends with COVID. Uh, we saw something first, we saw the impacts on the marketplace. We don't know what a second wave would entail. We see some global stories in the last few days that would suggest that there is a second wave already taking place in some countries. So it's very difficult to anticipate what that will mean for inventories in the fall, the marketplace in general, supply chain interruptions and so on. So the fishery will be like other components of the economy in the very short term in which largely unknown where the, where the COVID thing will, will, will bring us. The bottom line is though, if I was to sum it up as in what's the biggest challenge uh, in the short term, it is the markets and it's also our biggest opportunity. Because COVID will, uh, as, as Laura described, of a product diversification in agriculture, COVID will necessitate a re-examination of the marketplace in general. And the fishing industry has proven time and time again that it can do that. And I think that will be the very short-term issues. And still superimposed on all of this is the larger economic issues in general, in the economy as a whole, and how that will affect the fishery in many, many different ways. So that's an unknown. It's a combination of many, many challenges, but no doubt in the medium term, will present some opportunities as well. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, so now we get more tenuous and with any scenario planning, the further out you look, the more uh, dubious, uh, but we have to do it because people make long-term investments and market development takes time, et cetera. And when we look out five to 10 years, we know in every issue uh, on the planet, climate change is a big factor. We know in Newfoundland and Labrador and indeed throughout rural areas everywhere, uh, aging workforce, demographics is increasingly a challenge. Uh, technology is partly a solution to that. Uh, so, you know, a whole lot of issues there. Kevin, do you want to uh, weigh in on your uh, 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 looking into the crystal ball and uh, what do you think for the next five to ten years how big a role can the fishery play for the future of Newfoundland and Labrador so I, re I read somewhere or heard somewhere that we study history so we better understand the present and better be able to predict the future and I think that's certainly true in the fishery you know I think in order to look forward at the fishery you need to look back as well at the fishery so for example Imagine if we were having this conversation five years ago or 10 years ago, what would we have said? 
what would be the basis of how we look forward. I think we would have said five years ago that we're entering a warmer environmental regime, which has negative consequences for our principal economic species of shellfish, especially crab and shrimp, less so lobster. We would have said we have an aging population, demographics, especially in the processing sector, and, and probably less so in the harvesting sector, but certainly true as well. But we could not have anticipated that we would have had two unusually bad ice years, that we would have had a global pandemic, that we would have had a marketplace that in 2019 that drove crab to some of its highest prices ever. In spite of quota cuts, we still had the most, some of the most significant value of $5 a pound. So looking forward is, is extremely challenging in the fishery for that reason, because there's so many variables of unpredictability. So what really happened? We had, yes, a warming trend, but it started to cool again, especially on the Newfoundland shelf. We did see the declines in shrimp that were anticipated, but not so much in crab. Ground fish did not recover at the pace that many anticipated. So that's what the five years retrospectively tells us. So I think that's our guide to looking forward into the future. So what it tells us is this. From a resource perspective, the environment will be the driver. Hmm. Uh, it was in the last 10 years. It was in the 10 years before that. And the 10 years before that was the moratorium, which was also a huge environmental shift on the Newfoundland shelf and elsewhere. Uh, we, we have a very, very special situation here that makes us an interesting case study on environmental change. The Newfoundland shelf, the east coast of Newfoundland, Labrador, is where two major currents collide. The Labrador current, cold, and the Gulf Stream, warm. Because of its location, we are on the northern edge of many species and southern edge of many Arctic species. So environmental change of any kind all, no matter how small, will be very noticeable here. So we will continue to have that environmental uncertainty on a go forward basis. But we should keep in mind that that's not new. We've had that forever. We had examples of clash, uh, crashes in ground fish in the 1800s. So this is not new to us. What is really the key here is in many ways what we've always been able to do, adapt. Past has taught us that we, we can and will adapt. We have these larger forces, things that we can control, for example, are the, the ability to extract maximum value, whatever it is that we're harvesting. And, and that's the key, I think, to the success in the next five to 10 years. In terms of labor, yes, we have a labor issue. We've been talking about it for a long time. We can adapt and technology is part and parcel of the solution. Ironically, I think some technology will actually save jobs. And, uh, and that I think is important. Training, big part of the future. Uh, COVID is telling us that we may do training differently in the future. Society is changing. And as a result of that, I think we'll be able to provide continuous training, which I think will be the new order of business in the future, as opposed to one off. And I think we'll have to take advantage of the non-food element of fish, the nutraceuticals, the other elements of the product that gives us opportunities uh, into the future. So we will continue to have uncertainty uh, and, uh, and we will adjust. In terms of things like policies and regulations, my view of these things is that more or less a reflection of society in general in any event, and these things respond more on a short term rather than a planning basis. And we can cite many examples of how policy and regulations respond to specific circumstances. So very difficult to know what we're doing in five to 10 years because of the environmental uncertainties. But I think we can anticipate that the fishery will continue to play a huge role in agriculture in Newfoundland and Labrador in the future. It's just difficult to know what it is. But what we do know from the moratorium is that we can adjust, we will adjust, and we have the capacity on a broad components of our society to do exactly that. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, I like to always quote uh, your new boss, uh, Glenn Blackwood at the Marine Institute, who always says, you know, if we can get the fishery right, it's a never ending mega project. <laughs> and, uh, getting it right is, uh, and of course, with environment, a lot of issues out of our control. So Laura, aquaculture is, is seen as a real emerging area. <coughs> 
and maybe a growing percentage of the total value, but what do you think looking out five to 10 years? Well, I guess hopefully we'll get through this uh, COVID phase and uh, out the other end of things. But uh, if you look at just numbers right now, I think it, a few years ago, uh, the, the stats show that 52% of all seafood eaten in the world was produced by aquaculture. We don't think of that much with our scale in, in Newfoundland and Canada, but globally it is. They're predicting by 2030, it will be up to 62%. What it's saying is the wild fishery is stable or may decline. What has got to replace that seafood source is aquaculture. If you're looking at the sheer population by 2050, from today's level of aquaculture production, it has to increase by 70% just to meet that predicted 9 billion people that we're going to have on the planet. So it's just to meet the sheer demand. So wherever we get our seafood, uh, it's got to be some form of reliance both on wild and reliance on farming technology. Uh, and that's where we look at it from an aquaculture point of view. Also, we have to look at if you're going to go into climate change and global warming issues, uh, we are going to be on that border of seeing these effects. We see it in the shellfish industry, for example. You know, we're seeing slight changes in the plankton in the water and things like that. These are things we have to monitor. Right now, it's not a major impact. We see changes affecting the temperature for the salmon farms. So therefore you change and adapt your technology to deeper nets and things like that to allow the fish into the cooler waters. So that's something or how you pick a site. Um, but people, when you look at the sheer production, if you look at uh, a recent figure, it said that right now we produce something like 17.5 billion salmon portion, meal portions. When you think of that, it only accounted for something like 290 square kilometers of farming area. That's a pinprick in the world uh, uh, if you put it on a map. So therefore, like farming on land, you have to adapt to different environments. And that's what we're doing in Newfoundland and in other areas of Canada with the salmon and mussel industry. Adapting technology, adapting to the environment, but using it in a, in a sustainable way. And it is sustainable. It's like any good farming practice. Um, interesting, Kevin mentioned, you know, education. Well, COVID is certainly bringing it to fore how we're going online and doing these virtual sessions. We're seeing that with like salmon technology in particular uses real time tracking right from the hatchery to the cage to right to the marketplace of your, your inventory and your stock. That's all by satellite technology and things like that. So what do I say to the next generation? You got great opportunities for jobs in the aquaculture industry. It's not only in feeding the fish, which is all done by camera technology and automation. It's in fish health, it's in marketing and business. Uh, there's huge potential. And as the industry grows, we need people. There's a great transfer of people from other sectors like the wild fishery. They make great, uh, they adapt really well to working on aquaculture sites. Um, we may be recruiting from the oil fields soon, who knows, but if you want a job and a sector that is growing into the future, then aquaculture is certainly it. Thanks, Laura. And uh, really the intent of these scenario sessions was to help in the midst of COVID, 19 to look at the impacts but also to realize the real opportunities in so many sectors um, i have another question to get to but uh, kathy is monitoring online for those of you who are on webex you can go to the q a section and submit a question if you're on facebook live you can go to the comments and kathy is monitoring there uh, kathy do you have any questions from the audience right now or will i jump to my next one uh, before you do there's nothing there yet, so you can go ahead to the next one and hopefully we'll get a question in the meantime. All right. Well, one of the areas that uh, when we chatted before this session, both Kevin and Laura highlighted 
the importance of uh, fishery and aquaculture, especially for rural areas. And in both your cases, of course, you have backgrounds and expertise on indigenous communities. And maybe, uh, Laura, do you want to speak a little more about that, about how significant the, uh, the fishery and aquaculture is for future economic prosperity uh, throughout rural and remote regions of the province? Well, I grew up on the northeast coast of Newfoundland, uh, up in the Lissee area, and, and uh, involved in the farming uh, up in the Triton Roberts Arm area. Um, that has huge impact on the local communities and employment opportunities and things like that. So when you look at the, the local people, you know, you have whole families, whole communities, whether it's in Triton or if it's in Hermitage or whatever, that are reliant on not only one, it's not only aquaculture, it's a combination between the wild fishery and aquaculture. Um, so, you know, the sustainability in the long term is going to rely on diversifying and uh, uh, a network of systems that feeds resources and information between different sectors. It's it's not relying simply on one sector. Mm. For um, local groups, uh, uh, you know, uh, you have youth, and I've in past worked with groups up in Labrador and on the West Coast through uh, different groups, in particular uh, women in science and engineering, Newfoundland, Labrador, you're trying to encourage young young people, uh, women and, uh, and uh, guys into different sectors and looking to broaden what might be available, but still maintain their livelihoods within their community and that social network, and that's important. Kevin, uh, your take, you've been in this industry as well as coming from a rural community uh it, its significance and and the likelihood that it will stay that way so of course the history books are filled with the significance of the fishery uh in in the as european fish harvesters arrive from europe and and the settlement of newfoundlanders uh, of newfoundland labrador by europeans was very much about the fishery it's equally true for the various indigenous cultures that's here now and was here prior to european contact that the fishery played a significant role in their culture and, 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 and in their, in their lo daily life in every respect. And that is why precisely why harvesting of the ocean fisheries are uh, very, very much important to indigenous communities today in Newfoundland and Labrador and indeed across Canada. Uh, the groundfish moratorium uh, has shown us that uh, species come and go uh, based on the environment. We know now from reviewing history that that's not entirely new. Maybe we saw some extreme examples with the moratorium, but generally, as long as the sun shines, is here, uh, there is primary production, meaning that there's something happening in the ocean and various species will emerge, many of which will have commercial applications. As I said earlier, the key is to accept the variation and the change, that the variability is a part of where we live. Our ocean conditions are very much like that, and that will always be the case. But the opportunity for the future is so different than the past, when we were so dependent on individual species in very select market conditions. We now have products that can be accessed the entire globe. We now have products that can be used for, for food, for other applications of pharmacy and, and, and across in some different industrial applications. So no matter the species, the opportunities will be there and I think we will take advantage of it. I think we also need to be cognizant of looking at the future and the role of the fishery and agriculture for that matter in the economy is where, where are fisheries and agriculture in the policy setting agenda, if you will, of the province or society in general. And I, I'm one of those who believe that Many elements of fisheries policy is a response to larger society issues and policies. And that I think the fishery will become more and more important and understood. It's the sustainability, it's the health benefits, it's the cyclical nature of other resource sectors. And therefore fish will be seen and agriculture as very much a, more of a steady, more of a continuous thing. So I'm very optimistic actually, 
about its place in future. And I'm very optimistic about how young people are starting to view the fishery in that context, health benefits and so on. In a, uh, in a post uh, COVID recovery, parking the COVID consequences to short term things, I'm intrigued by some of the longer term consequences of COVID. We, we're starting, I think, as societies to think about what's happening with the downtown towers of Toronto. We're starting to think about what does learning look like in the future. And we're starting to think about a new way of looking at work. It's no longer about the input of eight hours a day. It's about the output of work. It's a, a careers are less about 30, 40 years in a select location. It's more about a portfolio of work, a career that does many things. And I think Laura was mentioning that as well in terms of the integrated nature. I'm fascinated by how these structural changes that may materialize because of COVID could impact the fishery. We know, of course, that the fishery, at least as we understand it today, cannot be done from home and certainly fish processing either, but it's the associated impacts. Can the spouse work from home instead of an office in Toronto? What does that mean for the opportunities for individuals to stay in rural Newfoundland? I think one of the greatest investments we could make is in the infrastructure of communications to avail of the opportunities of the digital world, more so perhaps in the physical infrastructure associated with a specific fishery or anything else, because that's what will keep people in rural Newfoundland and therefore address some of those longer term or, or even immediate issues with labor supply and so on. On a personal scale, I'm fascinated to think back some 35 years ago. My father was a fisherman. My brothers and I left home to go to faraway places to go to school first, and ultimately to pursue careers, in many cases, in fisheries related activities. But nevertheless, we left the fishery. But I'm just imagining what if it's 2020 and I could stay home and do my university courses, perhaps even work from home. Would I still be associated with the fishery in some way? I think these are the interesting questions to ask ourselves. A little bit of blue sky, perhaps, but it's interesting to think of some of the events of these past few months can really have long-term consequences on the fishery, especially in rural Newfoundland and Labrador. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Kathy, I've seen some comments flashing up on the screen there. I don't know if there's something you can pose as a question or how are we looking? Sure, there's uh, one question came in from Barry Darby, uh, and this question is for Kevin, primarily, I guess, Laura, you can weigh in too, if you'd like. Um, if the current and future of the wild fishery is determined by the environment, why are we using past standards? In other words, the LRP to harvest only 3% of the Northern cod stock when the biology of the stock has always been able to supply a yield of 20 to 40%. That's a very good question and a very interesting question, uh, because I guess the point being is that if the environment is the ultimate determiner, what difference does it make what input you put on it from a management perspective in the short term? The problem is, is that we're often managing species at the limit of what we can harvest. And the second part is we don't have any other information other than what we do. We can't control anything else other than the activity of fishing. That's our really only control mechanism uh, to determine what we do and what the impact and consequences of what we do. So until we get a far greater understanding of that larger ecosystem equation, there's very we have very limited tools to, to manage other than to control the level of activity of fishing and hope that that has consequences for sustainability, for growth, that that's our objective and so on and so forth. Thanks, Kevin. Laura, did you want to weigh in on that one? Well, I guess from an aquaculture point of view, when we choose an area to do salmon farming or mussel farming, it follows from years of research into what's going on there with the, the waters, the currents, temperatures and things like that. Even then, when you put your fish in, it's more years of monitoring and adapting. There's no one rule, every bay and every site is slightly different. How you monitor and, and work with that environment, because again, you're a, if you're a good farmer, you're trying to do sustainable uh, practices that don't impact the environment or minimize the impact. We can't say 
there's no impact. That's no different than the footprint of your house and our roads, uh, or whether it's a field with potatoes in it, there's an impact. But you minimize that and you try to sustain it for that environment for the long term, because you're looking to the next generations, the same as you do with the wild fishery. What can be there and what can be sustained and what is the best? Um, so I think, you know, when you look at uh, farming practices and the environmental parameters, you have to be very careful in what you do is for the long term. Thanks, Laura. Uh, we try to clue up these sessions in 45 minutes, but we do have, I think, one more question. Maybe, Kathy, if you can pose that, and then, Kevin, you can be, give your response, and that'll also be any final comment you want to make, and then we'll let Laura finish us off. Uh, Kathy, what do you have? Sure. Uh, this question comes in from uh, Megan Philpot, and she asks, despite some increased in, in demand, sorry, despite some decreases in demand for seafood this year, there has been difficulty filling positions such as fish processing. Can you speak to the importance of securing talent for success of the industry in the long term, uh, such as temporary foreign workers? Great question. And so this will be Kevin, your final answer to that and any final thoughts and then back to Laura. So as a head of school of fisheries, you know, uh, I'm very interested in securing talent and, and what we can be doing in terms of training for the future. I think uh, in the short term, uh, there are no question. There are many challenges securing the, the sufficient labor in, especially in the processing sector and in the longer term. Uh, technology may be part of that solution and the associated training that goes with it will produce the opportunity. Uh, temporary foreign workers is an interesting concept. I, I, I'm a, a strong supporter of immigration in general. I believe Canadian Canada is largely built on immigration, always has been, and will continue to be an important component of our future. Specific to that program, of course, in 2020, it's interrupted by COVID and the ability for folks to travel uh, from foreign countries into Newfoundland and Labrador. But I believe it can be a, a component of the short-term needs in the labor force in Newfoundland and Labrador, for sure. But I think in the longer term, it's innovation and technology and the training that will be necessary to go with it will form a big part of, of that labor shortage. In terms of closing comments, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, I'm largely an optimist uh, when it comes to the fishery. Uh, I, I know that there will be many, many challenges and disruptions in the next five, 10 years and onward that we do not even anticipate today. But I would say to all of you that that's not new. We've been experiencing that for a very long time. And as a community, as a society, Newfoundland and Labrador has done very well in adjusting to that reality. I do believe that COVID and some of the technological in, uh, disruptions that are taking place in society is an opportunity for the fishery and not all bad. And, uh, and I believe that the fishery will continue to play a significant role in the Newfoundland and Labrador economy post COVID. And I also think that perhaps COVID and the other associated economic consequences on other activities will highlight the need for the fishery to be seen that way. And as hopefully as an opportunity for young people to stay in rural Newfoundland and use the fishery or agriculture as an opportunity uh, for their future and choose that as a career. Thanks, Kevin. And Laura, your career, I think, also has been very much around talent in fish <laughs> and agriculture. Uh, how would you weigh in on that? Um, well, again, uh, I, I'll go back to uh, growing up in rural Newfoundland. And um, my father was both a teacher and a, and a fisher. And uh, But the problem was when you hired young teachers was to get them to come new talent and stay in rural Newfoundland. So in the end, my mother and father started building apartments to house them. And that then made them stay because they had something equivalent uh, of good quality to live in and they developed their own families. We're seeing the same thing in aquaculture. One of the first moves for the aquaculture industry on the South Coast is to look at the housing issues. Uh, how can you entice new workers in on shift work, like you see flying in and out of Alberta. So therefore, can they come in for 10 days, two weeks, do a shift and out? So they're looking at mo mobile housing and all 
different forms to get workers to still remain connected to their families, but coming in for short-term work, the same as mining companies do, and all of these. Um, uh, and with that, then it will spin off eventually. You will start seeing families ultimately stay in that area or transition into there. Uh, foreign worker is another option. COVID obviously puts uh, a stop to some of that right now, but ultimately in the food sector, we're seeing it in Agriculture Canada, workers in Ontario and Quebec, you need some of those workers and our country is based on that. So yes, that is the next stage that if we don't have enough of our own population to meet it, then you bring in some. You bring in people that like rural life and that's where aquaculture is. It's rural Newfoundland. And I think sometimes there's a disconnect between the consumer in urban centers of where their food is coming from and how we produce it out in rural areas of Newfoundland, whether it's aquaculture or agriculture or wild fishery. Um, again, sometimes you go in a grocery store and you forget the food line and where it's all coming from. And with that, there's a whole sector of people that are both growing that and providing the services to that industry. Thanks, Laura. And that maybe is a great way to clue up. And hopefully these scenario sessions will help raise awareness and educate on uh, the, the significance of sectors that are in rural and remote areas, as well as urban, and how they uh, impact the future of our province and connect with urban areas around the world too. Uh, really wanna thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, we'll be winding down these sessions for the summer, but we'll be back again in the fall with some more conversations, as well as a lot of exciting new programs at the Harris Center. Uh, these sessions are recorded and are available on the Harris Center website. Tell your friends. Uh, lots of people go back and use these as a resource. Keep an eye on our website and our social media channels for updates as the summer proceeds. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter, The Regional. It's a great way to get all the latest information about upcoming events, new initiatives, and the latest reports and podcasts. If you have any questions or suggestions, send us an email. Thanks as always to our great Harris Center and Amira Innovation Exchange teams uh, today, Kathy Newhook and John Duff. And thanks again, especially to our guests, Laura and Kevin, for their great expertise and passion for the sector. And uh, thank you all for viewing today and have a great day. All the best. Thank you. Thank you.